Welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. See, the point is this. In any situation, either you're going to have the victory or the enemy is. If, if, if the Lord has the victory, you have the victory. If you don't have the victory, the enemy has the victory. So you've just got to decide, well, am I going to be victorious or is the enemy going to be victorious? Are you there? Okay, so we read in Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to, we could read a whole section, but I'm going to just start at verse 11. He strengthens you with all the power of his glorious might, and it is this power at work in you that gives you patience, enabling you to persist in doing his will, and causes you to maintain your joy, thanking God the Father for all he has done in you. Now, all this is his power at work within you, right? Yes, it is his power in you that means you are now qualified to share in the inheritance he has prepared for all those he has called and set apart to belong to the kingdom of light. For he has already rescued us from the devil's dominion of darkness and and has brought us into his own kingdom, the kingdom that belongs to the son he loves. It is through him that we have been made worthy in God's sight through the forgiveness of all our sins so that now we belong to him. Right, now just look at that last verse again. It is through him, through what Christ has done for us, that we have been made worthy in God's sight. Now, that will constantly be challenged by the devil, that truth. And it is a truth that you have to hold on to if you are going to be victorious. I have been made worthy in God's sight, period. And no matter who says what or tries to do uh, or come against me, I have been made worthy through Christ Jesus, through the blood of the Lamb. Jesus is the only one who is worthy in himself, but he has made us worthy. He is the only one who is holy in himself, but he's made us holy. Now, we've just got to keep this in mind as we look at these scriptures. I'm going to take you through a whole lot of Old Testament scriptures first, uh, using the, the new translation. Right from the beginning, in Genesis 14.20, Blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Now this is Melchizedek appearing to Abraham. Blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Right, now this is the beginning of your victorious mindset. Are you ready? The, the Lord, the Lord, because he's talking about the Lord, Melchizedek, you see. The Lord has delivered your enemies into your hands. Now we don't fight against people, we fight against or the spiritual forces of wickedness. But he has delivered your enemies into your hands. Exodus 14, 13. Moses told the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and watch. The Lord will work deliverance for you today. For the Egyptians you, you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you will be at peace. Now, there are certain things that the Lord tells us that we have to do in order to be victorious. We'll come to those in a moment when we come into the New Testament. The point is that if you have a victorious mindset, you understand that the battle belongs to the Lord, that he does the fighting so long as you do what he tells you to do. You overcome because he does the fighting. 
If you're doing the fighting, then the outcome is dubious. Okay, Exodus 15.1, this uh, great song of Moses, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. And you are in him, and he is in you. So you are in the one who has triumphed gloriously. There are one or two things Jesus doesn't know how to do. He doesn't know how to sin and he doesn't know how to be defeated. And you are in the one who doesn't know how to be defeated. Are you there? Exodus 15 verse 6. Lord, you have revealed your glory through the power of your right hand, for your right hand has smashed the enemy in pieces. That's what the Hebrew means, to smash in pieces. You have overthrown those who opposed you by the greatness of your majestic power. You have demonstrated that in your anger they were consumed like stubble. Now, to have a victorious mindset, you have to understand that because you live in Christ and he lives in you, Anything or anybody that comes against you comes against him. That's why he will fight for you. Because actually, they're not coming against you, they're coming against him. They're not being critical of you, they're being critical of him. They're not accusing you, they're accusing him. Because you are in him. Hello? And you belong to him. You are his own treasured possession. Are you breathing? Okay. Exodus 17.15 is one of the great covenant names of God in the Old Testament. One of the seven covenant names of God. The Lord is my banner, my victory. That's what the, when it says the Lord is my banner, it actually means the Lord is my victory. It's the banner of victory. Don't get too excited, it's Wednesday. Deuteronomy 1, 29. Then I said to you, do not be intimidated or afraid of them. See, if you've got a victorious mindset, you're not going to be intimidated by people or by any circumstances. So do not be intimidated or afraid of them. The Lord your God goes before you and will fight for you. Can you see there's a, there's a whole pattern here, isn't there? One scripture after another. Deuteronomy 11, uh, 22. If you carefully obey all the commands I am giving you to keep, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to stay close to him, Then the Lord will drive out all those nations before you. You will take possession of nations that are are even greater and more powerful than you. Everywhere you place your feet shall become yours. Now that last bit, you see, everybody is much more familiar with than what goes before. But you look at the context and God says, I will give you victory even over nations. Now, if you transfer that into the spiritual realm, it's not just little demons, but over the authorities and powers of the enemy, I will give you as my people the victory. Amen. Okay, Deuteronomy 20, verse 3. Listen, Israel, today you are about to go into battle against your enemies. Do not be intimidated or fearful. Do not be terrified, nor show any panic before them. For the Lord your God goes before you himself to fight on your behalf against your enemies and so give you victory. Now just take hold of that last part especially. The Lord himself, or the Lord your God, goes before you himself to fight on your behalf against your enemies and so give you victory. He gives you the victory. You don't fight for it. He gives it to you. There are certain things you have to do. And we'll come to those. 
But if you do those certain things that God tells you to do, he gives you the victory. Hallelujah. You're getting too excited again. Deuteronomy 28 verse 7. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your very eyes. So when things rise up against you, you are going to see the victory. If they come against you from one direction, they will run from you in seven. They'll be dispersed. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is our refuge. Beneath us are his everlasting arms. He will drive out the enemy before you, saying, let him be destroyed. Now, it's very important scripturally that when you are dealing with with these things that come against you, they get destroyed, not just rebuked. You rebuke something, it can come against you again, but you destroy it and it can't come against you again. The Lord destroys it because you've done what you were supposed to do. Deuteronomy 33, 29. Israel, be joyful. Who can be compared with you, a people the Lord has saved? We belong to Israel, don't we? He is your shield, your helper, and wields the sword of the majestic king. Your enemies shall submit to you, and you will destroy the high places of their idolatry. If you're going to be victorious, you're going to have this sort of fighting mentality, but understanding that it's the Lord that gives you the victory. It's the Lord that undertakes the battle on your behalf. Joshua 21, 44, the Lord gave them victory on every side according to the promise he had given to their forefathers. None of their enemies were able to stand against them. Just say this, none of my enemies enemies will be able to stand against me. whether they're demonic enemies, whether they're people who oppose you, none of them will be able to stand against you. So long as you do the things that God tells you to do. I keep saying that, don't I? Right? So it's going to be important for us to understand those things. Okay. 1 Samuel 14, 6. If the Lord is prepared to work for us, nothing will prevent him from giving us the victory no matter what our numbers. It doesn't matter how few we are and how, it's how big it seems the enemy's forces are, God will give us the victory. Why? Because he is prepared to work for us. Because we are in him and he is in us and we belong to him. We are his people. 2 Samuel 7, 9. Wherever you have gone, I have been with you and I have defeated all your enemies making your name great. Now, if he makes his name great through operating through you, he makes your name great. See, he wants your name to be great because you're honoring the greatness of his name by believing him to give you the victory. 2 Samuel 23, 5. Despite the behavior of my ancestors has made an everlasting covenant with me so that everything will now be in his order and will remain secure for this is the victory that I desire and will he not surely do this it doesn't matter what disorder there has been in the past God brings everything into his order so that you can have the victory hallelujah hallelujah That's why we need his mercy. Because when he shows his mercy to us, he brings everything back into order. He forgives us, he restores us, he establishes us again in the truth, and he gives us the victory. Hallelujah. I'm happy. I don't know about you. 1 Kings 20 verse 13. The Lord says, do you see this vast army? Today I will surely give you the victory over all who come against you, and you shall know for certain that I alone am the Lord. You don't have to be afraid to look at the enemy. If you are going to come against the enemy, you have to look at the one that you're resisting. 
You don't run and hide and try to conceal yourself. You, you go straight towards the enemy. You advance and the Lord advances before you. But we'll come on to that a, a little bit later. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, 2 Kings seventeen thirty seven. If you carefully obey the laws and commandments the Lord wrote down for you, then you will not worship any other gods, nor will you forget the covenant I made with you or desire any other gods. Instead, you will live in awe of the Lord your God and he will give you the victory over all your enemies. Living in the fear of the Lord gives you victory over all your enemies. Are you getting a victorious mindset? I mean, this is just the Old Testament. The New Testament, the promises are even better, aren't they? Hallelujah. 2 Chronicles 14, 11. O Lord our God, help us, for we trust in you, and in your name we fight against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let our enemies prevail over you. You see, if we are his people, if anything prevails over us, it prevails over God because we're in Christ and he is in us. That is unthinkable. So you see, the prayer is here. Look, we're your people. Don't let the enemy prevail over you. Now, we would say, Lord, we are in Christ. Don't let the enemy have any victory over you because we're in you and you are in us. Victorious mindset, faith mindset. I am in Christ. I don't visit him, I live in him. And he lives in me, he's come to make his home in me. So anything that comes against me comes against him. Any accusation against me is an accusation against him. Can you get the idea of this? It's having a victorious... It's actually just having a faith mindset, actually. But a faith mindset is a victorious mindset. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I'm happy. Uh, 2 Chronicles 2015, the Lord says to you, do not be afraid or terrified because of this great multitude, for the battle belongs to the Lord, not you. You see, we know some of these phrases, the battle belongs to the Lord everywhere we tread our feet. Uh, But you see, you've got to see the context. It's all within the context of the Lord giving us victory. Psalm 1834, he trains me for battle so that I can do what in the natural would be impossible for me. But we've got to understand what we've got to do, what battle we've got to do so that he would do the fighting for us. Seems strange, doesn't it? But nevertheless, that's the truth. Psalm 20, verse 5. We will shout for joy because of of your salvation, and in God's name we will raise banners of victory. May the Lord answer all all your prayers. We will raise banners of victory. Hallelujah. Well, I'm happy. Psalm 24, 8. Who is the king of glory? The Lord who is strong and mighty, the Lord victorious in battle. I mean, nothing can overcome the Lord. If he's going to fight for you, that's it. Done deal. Psalm 27 verse 5. For he will keep me under his protection whenever there is trouble and shield me from harm in his presence, setting me above whatever comes against me. I shall then rise up over my enemies even though they surround me. And I will offer shouts of triumphant joy to the Lord. I will sing his praises. I like that. Shouts of triumphant joy. Praise God. Psalm 32, 7. You are my refuge. You will protect me from trouble, for you will surround me with shouts of deliverance and victory. We will have those shouts of of triumphant joy. But I like this verse, you see. The Lord will surround me with shouts of deliverance and victory. I'll go for that one. Am I the only happy one here this morning? All right, Psalm 44, 5. We uh, We shall overcome our enemies through you and trample down those who oppose us by the power of your name. We are going to trample them down. 
because he's going to give us the victory. He's going to crush them beneath our feet. Psalm 42, 1, clap your hands and shout to God in triumph, all you people of the earth. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is the great King who reigns over the whole earth. Hey, come on. Clap your hands and shout to God in triumph. I'm not going to read all of them. We've just got to be very selective here now. Psalm 56, verse 9. My enemies will retreat when I call on you. Of this I am sure, for God is on my side. I mean, if you're living in him and he's living in you, he's on your side. Because you're on his side. Hallelujah. Anybody who dares to come against you comes against him. Can you see what a nonsense it is for Christians to start judging and accusing one another, coming against one another? I mean, it's crazy stuff. And that's the very thing the enemy encourages to undermine faith in the victory, not just personally, but the corporately that the church is to have. Are you there? Okay. Uh, where are we? Uh, Isaiah 9, verse 3, You have caused the nation to become great and have increased the people's joy, the joy of harvest time, the joy of victory over the enemy. I like that. Amen. Oh, for you have shattered the yoke that burdened them and the rod that oppressed them. (coughs) It's interesting, you see. The Lord shatters all the oppression and then gives them the harvest time where there are shouts of victory. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Jeremiah 20, verse 11. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So those who oppose me stumble and cannot prevail against me. They shall be greatly ashamed and will not prosper. Their confusion will continue and will never be forgotten. I guarantee this. Anybody who comes against you will be in confusion. doesn't matter who they are. They will be in confusion simply because they're coming against you. Because if they come against you, they come against the Lord. And so there will be confusion. He sows confusion in anyone who comes against him. Therefore, anyone who comes against you. They will just be confused. And you will see it in your experience. Anybody that judges you, criticizes you, accuses you, you can guarantee they will be in confusion. Because it's the word of God. Are you there? Hallelujah. So you need to pray for them. Joel 2 verse 11. The Lord goes before his army with a shout. See, it's not only us that's shouting, it's the Lord shouting. Oh, wonderful, isn't it? His camp is great, and those who obey his word are mighty. So you've only got to obey, and you'll be mighty. The day of the Lord is great and awesome. Who can withstand it? The day when the Lord acts. I mean, who can withstand that? Wow. Who can withstand him? <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. You've got to get this book when it comes out. You get all these scriptures. Right? <laughs> Micah, chapter 7, verse 9. Because I have sinned against him, it is right that the Lord should be angry with me. Now listen. Yet he pleads my case. Now isn't this amazing? You see, every one of us in this room sometimes sins, fails, messes up, grieves the Lord. And you would think that that would give opportunity for God to allow us to be defeated. But not a bit of it. Because even if you mess up, you're still in him and he is still in you. Are you there? Because I have sinned against him, it is right that the Lord should be angry with me. Yet he pleads my case 
and deals justly, that is, with his justice, with those who have oppressed me. You see, when you mess up, that gives the opportunity for people to oppress you. And you would think, well, wait a minute, that seems quite justified on the one hand, but no, he is, they are oppressing one of his children. They're oppressing someone who lives in him. They're oppressing someone in whom he lives. Are you getting this? So he will bring me out into the light, and I will see his righteousness established. Then my enemies will see and be put to shame. Now, this is a very important scripture because it says, well, even, even if I've messed up, even if I'm not in a very good place with the Lord, and people start to come against me and criticize me and judge me because of that, God is going to lead me through, bring me out into the light, and then the end of the matter will be they will be put to shame, not you. Because the Lord has forgiven you, the Lord has restored you, the Lord has dealt with his justice, the justice of Jesus with you. If we put the New Testament uh, understanding onto this. Zechariah 4, 6. It will not be by your might or power that you, will pre- that you will prevail, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You see, again, the context, we all know this is not by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. But what he is talking about is prevailing against your enemies. That's the context. How will you prevail? By the spirit. Where is the spirit living in you? Are you there? Malachi 4, verse 3. You will overcome those who do evil. They will be as ashes beneath your feet on the day that I act, declares the Lord Almighty. I mean, this God of love knows how to deal with those who come against him. It's not a clever thing to do, is it? Can you see it's not a clever thing to come against your brother or sister because... Well, you don't need me to preach it, do you? It's obvious from the Scripture. Okay, now, we come into the New Testament. Jesus gave authority to his disciples over all the power of the evil one. Now, remember this. Those men to whom he originally gave that authority were Jews. And all that you have just heard would have been very familiar to them. They would have known their scriptures. Especially all the the scriptures that surrounded the deliverance from Egypt. So they would be very familiar because, I mean, there's lots more scriptures than those that I've read out. But this continuous revelation of how the Lord fights for you, how he preserves and delivers his people, how he saves them from oppression. They'd have been very, very well aware of all of that. They would have been aware that the battle belongs to the Lord. They would have known all these scriptures about the Lord going like a mighty warrior, the Lord saying that he would fight for his people. They would have known these things because it was the history of their nation. Now, we come from different nations here, but you know something of the history of your nation. The history of the nation was something very, very important to the Jews. They found their identity in their history. They still do. The mentality of of the Jews today has been so colored by the Holocaust because it's part of their history. 
If you go to visit Israel, everybody will tell you, you must go to the, the Holocaust Memorial. Why? Because this helps you to understand the identity and the mentality of the Jewish people. It's their history. So these guys to whom Jesus said that would have been very, very familiar with all this history and with how God had delivered and saved and fought for his people, even though time and again they had rebelled against him, denied him, worshipped false gods and all the rest. Yet still he had brought them through. And now here he is fulfilling his promise in sending his beloved son. They understood the authority and the power of God over and against whatever man could do. They understood what it was to be oppressed and opposed by enemies. And now here is Jesus saying to them, I give you authority over all the power of the devil himself. of the one who lies behind all that oppression, all that accusation, all that opposition. I give you authority over all his powers. Now, God himself has the authority over the devil himself. But what he was saying to the disciples is, I give you authority over all of his powers so that nothing will harm you. Now he says to them that you have the authority, therefore, to bind, restrict, limit, prevent, that's what the word means, on earth, anything that heaven does not allow or restricts or prevents. In other words, he's saying if it's not allowed in heaven, you have the authority to forbid it on earth. I'm giving you that authority. Why? Because you now belong to the heavenly kingdom. And if we just jump forward a bit to after Pentecost, because you live in Christ and he lives in you by the power of his spirit. So the scripture has even more significance for us now than it had for the disciples when they first heard it. And, he says, you have the authority to release, to loose whatever heaven releases and looses. Why? Because you live and reign and rule in Christ. And he is seated at the right hand of God in triumph. So you are living in the triumphant one who has overcome sin, who has overcome sickness, who has overcome death. Are we getting it? Now you see, if you believe in the victory like this and someone you're praying for believes in the victory like that, then you're home and dry, aren't you? Because if any two agree concerning anything, it's not so easy if you agree in the vi- believe in the victory, but the other one doesn't. But if you both agree with the victory, then it should be plain sailing, shouldn't it? If you are exercising that authority together. Yes. 
Now, Jesus says to the disciples that he gives them that authority. But there's no point in having authority unless you use it. If you have authority but don't use it, don't exercise it, you will still be defeated by the circumstances. Or you will feel that you're defeated by the circumstances. Why? Because you're not being obedient in using the very authority that God has given you to use. You see, it's the same when Jesus teaches in prayer. He says, speak to the mountain. Now, the mountain might be a demonic power. The mountain might be the people that are coming against you in some way. Speak to them. Now, you command the mountain to be moved because that's part of exercising the authority that God has given you because authority is expressed in commanding. That's how you use authority. You command. That's why within the church, when the leadership tells you to do something, you do it. Because they have the Lord's authority. But we're not going to get into that this morning. But you come against them, you're coming against the Lord's authority because he is the one that's put them in place. It's a serious thing to do in Scripture, a very serious thing to do. But that's another sermon. What we're doing now as we understand as, that we need this victorious mindset is that we have to exercise and to use the authority that God has given us in prayer. You speak to the mountain. He doesn't say you have to move the mountain. The Lord moves the mountain. You exercise the authority and the Lord fights for you. The Lord transforms the situation. Speak to the mountain, it will be moved. It doesn't say you will move it, but you have exercised your authority. You have exercised your faith. You have believed the victory. Because Jesus says that when you speak to the mountain, you must believe in your heart that it will be moved. In other words, you need a victorious mindset when you pray and address the mountain. It's not, I wonder if this will work or not. It has to because of the authority with which you are speaking to the mountain. It's not because you're just doing something in a mechanical way because you know this is scripture, but you're doing it with, Jesus says, with that full assurance of faith that is in your heart because you have a victorious mindset. I have the victory in this situation. Because I am in Christ, I have the victory. I know no defeat. Would have been a good place to say hallelujah, but anyway. So Jesus gives this authority and they saw, even though at that time they weren't filled with the Spirit, they saw the outworking of that when they went and put that authority into practice. And Jesus gave authority not only to the 12, but to the 72. And if you remember, when they came back, they'd seen miracles of all kinds. But the thing that really tickled them more than anything was the fact that the demons submitted to them. Wow! We have authority even over the demons, even over the devil. And Jesus probably said, well, didn't that what I told you? I'm you know, giving you authority over all the power of the evil one. But he, you see, he says, well, don't rejoice in the victory, but rejoice in why you have the victory. Your names are written in heaven. You belong to the kingdom of heaven. You are in the one who rules and reigns. That's why you have the victory. So give thanks to God. Shouts of triumph, shouts of praise. Okay, so 
they saw all that being outworked. But then if we come into the epistles and we see how the church has to move in this same authority, this same power, because authority and power are linked together in Scripture, they have to come and apply this authority and see the outworking of these principles in the life of the church. So Romans 8, verse 4, In Christ, all the demands God expressed in the laws he gave were fulfilled. So we now live in the good of what he accomplished. He succeeded where we had all failed miserably, so that now we can live as if we had succeeded. (laughs) He gives us the victory, but it looks as if we got the victory. But actually, it's his victory. Are you there? His success has become our success so long as we no longer live. Now listen, 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 because this is one of the things, you see, that we have to do. So long as we no longer live in the weakness of our old sinful nature, but now live led by and filled by God's Spirit. What does that mean? The Spirit will always lead you into victory. Hallelujah. Some of you have been struggling with issues for years. God wants to give you a victorious mindset so that the issues then will be transformed. Amen. Difficult to see the situation transformed unless you have the victory within your spirit first. Are you breathing? Romans 8.37 No, in all these things, all these things that come against us, all these things that can afflict us, all the problems that can arise. No, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him. More than conquerors, more than victorious. Why? Because he gives us the victory. You're victorious if you fight and you win, but you're more than a conqueror if you win because he's fought. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, this is a victorious mindset. I am more than a conqueror. Now, it's not just repeating that to yourself. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. Because you know that it's scripture. No, you believe it. I'm more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. I know no defeat because I'm more than a conqueror. Are you there? No, in all these things we are more than victorious through him, for he has already won the victory for us and demonstrated such love for us. It's good, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God, for he always leads us in his triumphant procession because we are in Christ. Can you imagine Christ leading somebody into failure? Come follow me and you will fail. (laughs) Trust me and you will fail. See, it's unthinkable, isn't it? It's absolutely unthinkable. When you put it like that. Uh Uh-huh. So, he always leads us in his triumphant procession because we are in Christ and he uses us everywhere to go to spread the truth about him. How can you spread the truth if you're not living in it yourself? You know, I was was talking to you yesterday about why God lets us go through all kinds of oppression and difficulties and opposition. But actually, he he does a whole lot in you. He exposes, you know, all that refining we talked about, about gold last night. A lot of the, the yuck comes to the surface because we're put into those tight situations. It's only then that we see really what was in us. 
And you can't blame the circumstances because Jesus said it's not the circumstances. Nothing outside a man defiles a man, but only that which is within, within his own heart. So God puts you in those pressure points to actually show, to bring to the surface all the impurities that are in your heart. Unfortunately, people usually blame the circumstances. They say, well, it was his fault, it was her fault, it was their fault, it can't be my fault. And it isn't until they see, wait a minute, this is my heart that God is exposing. All these impurities need to be skimmed off. We saw that last night, didn't we? But there's another reason why the Lord lets us go through these things. Because when you go through events like that, you learn how to get the victory. And then once you've learned how to get the victory, he will lead your way all kinds of people that have got the same problems. Not so that you can just sympathize with them, but so you can show them the way to victory through those situations. So you're not just speaking glib words to them, but you have worked through the situation yourself. You know how God gives you the victory in those sorts of circumstances. Are you there? Even when sometimes you mess up and really grieve the Lord, get back and get restored. It's amazing how as soon as that has happened, God will lead your way a whole lot of other people that are messed up and you can help to get them restored. God never wastes a thing. It isn't that he wanted you to mess up, but if you do, he's sure going to use it. He's going to turn the negative into something good and use it positively for the benefit of other people. God never wastes a thing. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. With the weapon of truth, we demolish rational arguments that oppose the walk of faith. Faith and reason are not good bed companions. They don't go well together. We have the answer to every false way of thinking. See, what, what are we talking about? Having a victorious mindset. Yes. What is a false way of thinking? Anything that is not victorious. Why? Because it's not faith. If it's not victorious, it's not faith. So it's false. It's not the truth. Well, please yourself, but I believe it. We have the answer to every false way of, seek, of thinking that seeks to undermine the truth about God. We exercise authority. Look at, look at this. I want you to look at this. Look. We exercise authority in the way we think. You see, if you don't have the right thought, if you don't have the victorious mindset, then the rest can't happen. You won't speak with victory, you won't act in victory, you won't exercise the authority that God has given you. Are you there? We exercise authority in the way we think, denying every negative or rebellious thought. I can remember years and years and years ago now, because I'm as old as Noah, but <coughs> it seems so long ago, it must have been in a former incarnation. But I can remember when, when God began to teach me all this stuff. I mean, I was a very young pastor at the time, but, but I can remember He, he taught me how to take the shield of faith against every negative thought. And what he showed me was this, that just like the word of God is a good seed, a negative thought is like a weed. You remember in one of the parables... The enemy sowed tares among the wheat. And the Lord taught me, well, 
the Holy Spirit is always going to sow the good seed of the wheat. But the enemy, amongst all the good seed that the, 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 uh, that the Holy Spirit sows in your mind, the enemy will seek to sow tares among the wheat. And then the Lord said, now don't allow him to do that. Because if you accept a negative thought, it's sown. And how do you know it's sown? Because you will speak it. Once you speak it, it's because it was sown in your heart. This is why uh, Jesus says, from the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. Where did that negative thing come from? It was sown. And this is why Jesus says, nothing outside a man defiles a man. It's what is sown in your heart. You might not even know it's sown because when you sow seeds, you don't necessarily see that they've been sown. Are we getting this? Now, of course, as soon as you are aware of it, you can uproot it. You remember in the parable of the sower, there was the seed that fell in the soil where it was growing up okay, but there were other weeds that choked it and prevented it from coming to fruitfulness. You see, those other things that were sown were the devil's tares, the devil's weeds. Choked in that believer's life, choked the seed from becoming, the good seed, from becoming fruitful. All this negativity chokes the goodness. Are you with me? So, if we're going to have a victorious mindset, we must not allow the enemy to sow negative seed. And I can remember, I mean, when I first started to do this, it seemed like all day long, it, it was, well, it was like a battle, really, all day long. But what God was doing was establishing something that as soon as you hear something negative, reject it. So you see, when, uh, I've told you the testimony in the past, but but when, when I was told by the consultant that I had cancer, you see, it was immediately that I am not receiving. It might be a fact, but I'm not receiving that. From this moment, it's going. Yes. Why? Because, you see, instinctively, that was negative, the shield of faith, immediately. But you see, when anybody comes against you with accusation, that's a lie. Why? Because the devil is the accuser of the brethren. I'm not going to listen to accusation. I take the shield of faith against that. Are you there? He is the deceiver. How the deceiver of the brethren. How does he deceive? He sows negative seed. Now it's best not to let him sow it. If you've allowed him to sow it, as soon as you're aware of it, uproot it. By the blood of Jesus. Keep your mind clear of all the negativity. Now, sometimes, you see, what what happens when you go through a period of oppression, when the enemy is trying to oppress you? He bombards you with negativity. He absolutely bombards you. It's It's not just the odd thought, but it's boom, 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 boom. It's like being under an artillery attack. What's his purpose? To try to wear you down. Ultimately, for you to have a breakdown so that you can no longer function 
with a positive mindset. He will absolutely bombard you with negativity. That's what oppression is. A lot of depression is the result of being oppressed. Not all forms of depression, but some. So you see, when you're under bombardment, you have to know the Lord is my protection, the Lord is my refuge, the Lord is my strong tower. And the banner over me is his truth. I raise the banner of truth, the banner of his victory over my life. I'm not going under. It doesn't matter how many or who or what or why all this stuff is happening. I am not receiving any of it. Hallelujah. Can you understand that we're talking about spiritual things here? Because our fight isn't against flesh and blood. But can you understand that even, even a Christian can be an emissary of the, of, of the enemy by speaking negative things that have been sown by the enemy? You see, if, if the enemy sows a negativity in your heart, and then you give expression to it, you have become the voice of the enemy. Now that is the thing that Jesus was teaching Peter at Caesarea Philippi. When he looked him straight in the eye, and he said, get behind me, Satan, you're on the side of man, not of God. Why? Because he spoke from his reason that opposed the truth. One moment... He was the mouthpiece of the revelation of God the Father when he said, you are the Christ, the living God. The first one to openly proclaim that. That wasn't you, Simon. That was the Father in heaven. Hallelujah. The next minute, he is an emissary of the devil because he's denying the truth. Correcting Jesus. Not so, Lord. So that's why you need to keep your mind victorious, clear of all this negativity, lest you become a mouthpiece to someone else of something that has not come from God. Because God does not accuse his children. As we saw yesterday, he convicts, but he never accuses He doesn't criticize them even. God will never criticize you to someone else. Isn't that that wonderful? When you've done something wrong, he's not going to go and tell everybody else. He'll deal with you. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. All the other stuff is the enemy. So, as we keep hold of the truth, we take that shield of faith against anything that is not the truth because we're going to keep our minds clear of the enemy's Weeds. And when I started that, it was as if I was having to say, I rebuke that thought, I reject that thought, I'm not hearing that, I'm not listening to that. I seem to be doing it all day long. And I think it was because, you see, the enemy thought, right, we'll really see if this is going to (laughs) work. We'll we'll try to prevent this from really taking root in this guy's life. But then after a while, it becomes instinctive to you. 
You've got to keep your guard up because you put your guard down. The enemy will always take advantage. Okay, come on, you're holding me up again. Let's get back to this. Um, so there in 2 Corinthians 10, we exercise authority in the way we think, denying negative or rebellious thoughts and accepting only those that glorify Jesus so that we might obey him. Can you understand that a rebellious thought is something that opposes Scripture? That is a rebellious thought. We don't <laughs> like to use that word. Say, I wouldn't have a rebellious thought. Yes, you would. If you have a thought that opposes Scripture, it's a rebellious thought. Well, you don't want any rebellion to take heart, to take root in, in your mind, your heart. Heart, mind, remember. Hebrews 10, verse 12. But when this priest... Oh, no, wait a minute, I've missed some. Uh, Ephesians six sixteen. Well, your faith is like a shield that you have to take hold of and that enables you to overcome anything the devil throws at you. Yes! Doesn't matter what he throws, he can't get through that shield of faith if you put it in place. Somebody say hallelujah. Colossians 1.18, he is the head of his body, the church, for he was the first to rise from the dead, so that having conquered everything that opposed God's purposes, he should now have supremacy over all things. He has conquered everything that opposes God's purposes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hebrews 10, verse 12. But when this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered the one sacrifice of himself for our sins, a sacrifice that would never need to be repeated, he could sit down in triumph at God's right hand. Where are you? In him. In him who sits in triumph at God's right hand. And has now... Uh, where, where are we now? For... For he had accomplished his purpose. Now he awaits the time when all his enemies are under his feet and are made subject to him. Hallelujah. And we're part of that process of seeing all his enemies overcome. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 1 Peter, uh, verse 3. Uh, sorry, chapter 3, verse uh, 22. You were saved... Because in his resurrection, Jesus Christ overcame death and has now ascended into heaven where he reigns at God's right hand together with the angels, authorities, and powers that are in submission to him. Now you've got all that lot on your side. <laughs> if, if you are in Christ, seated triumphant in heaven, then all all the powers, all the angels, authorities, and powers that are in submission to him are on your side. Now, the importance of that is that you exercise the authority here on earth. They exercise the authority on your behalf in the heavenlies. See, there are times when I say, Lord, just, just get all your heavenly host operating in this situation. Why? So that he can give us an open heaven. Now, those powers that are in submission to him are greater than the powers that are in submission to the devils. There's conflict that goes in on in the heavenly places. Let me just give you a testimony of someone. I was... Uh, <clears throat> Ministering in this church, actually it was one of those occasions where God shook the whole building. Uh, but this was a big stone, wasn't this? It was a big stone building, hundreds of years old. Shook the thing when the Spirit came. Now the reason why, why, why did God do that? Well, we, we were praying beforehand. This was, you know, a number of churches coming together for this mission we were doing in this place. And uh, <clears throat> there was this lovely little man. He was, he was a deacon, I think, from one of the Baptist churches or something like that. And, and he prayed a, a rather foolish prayer because he said, Lord, we want you to move so strongly and powerfully tonight that you shake the building. <laughs> so God did. Oh. 
Uh, as a result, a whole lot of people getting healed. But one woman in particular, I shall always remember, she came forward and boom, she went down. And I mean, there were lots, there were hundreds of people at this thing, so, you know, people were coming and going. But this woman was there, and she stayed, and the rest of the meeting took place after the ministry, and she was still there. And half an hour after that, she was still there. She'd been there for a long time. And then when she, they asked me, they said, well, well, would you just come and see this lady because we want to make sure she's all right. So I said, I'm sure she is all right. But I went and saw her and, you know, just prayed and she sort of came back. <clears throat> and I said to her, well, what's been going on? She said, I've been watching a battle. Now, what her situation was is, is that she had cancer, seriously. And she said, I, as I lay there, I saw this battle taking place over me. It was as if I was watching a battle in heavenly places and there were the forces of the enemy trying to claim me and there were all these forces of God that were coming against them. And she just got up, totally healed. I thought, that's neat. Because it... (laughs) Because what what the Lord showed her, you see, is the spiritual battle that often goes on in situations like that. Where the devil is trying to claim somebody and the Lord won't let them go because his forces will fight them. Actually, there was was another situation there. This this was a different woman, but... Where, where this, this other woman was out for a long, long, long time. And uh, <coughs> she came around she came and her pastor wrote to me about her afterwards. He said that, that woman was the most disobedient and rebellious person in the whole congregation. I think he said more than that, that I've ever known. (laughs) The most disobedient, rebellious Christian that I've ever known. He said, that night she was completely transformed and is now the most submissive person that you could wish her to be. That's God, isn't it? But you see, that's the spiritual conflict that he resolves over people in the spirit. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, look, we've got to get on with this. Uh, 1 John 4, verse 4. However, dear children, because you belong to God, you have overcome these false spirits and those influenced by them. The Spirit of God lives in you, and he is far greater than the Spirit of Antichrist that is at work in the world. You have the victory over false spirits. Understand that often those false spirits will operate in people around you or people that you come into contact with. What is coming from their lives is something that is false. It is not the truth. Maybe reason, it may be facts, but it's not the truth. But you have the victory. Hallelujah. 1 John 5 verse 4. Everyone who has received the new birth that God gives overcomes the spirit that influences the world around him. All these spirits are operating in the world, aren't they? It is our faith in Jesus and what he has done that gives us victory over worldliness. Victory over worldliness. That is important. Because you see, there is the spirit of this world. It's a spirit that is operating out there in the world causing people to oppose Jesus. But he's given us the victory over that spirit of worldliness, yes? I ask you, who has really overcome this worldliness? Obviously, only, uh, only he who believes and trusts in Jesus as God's victorious son. Mm. Hallelujah. Then, just to finish... Uh, 
these scriptures. There's, there's all the things from Revelation 2. Let anyone with spiritual understanding hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I will allow anyone who is victorious to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. No one who is victorious will be harmed by the second death, the lake of fire. To he who is victorious I will give the hidden manna and a white stone of complete forgiveness. On this stone a new name will have been written, which no one will know except the one who receives it, signifying that he has a completely new inheritance. To him who is victorious, who keeps my ways unto the end, <clears throat> I will give authority over the nations. Whee! That's not bad, is it? Uh, just as I received authority from my father, he will shepherd them with an iron rod that breaks clay pots into pieces. I will also give the morning star myself to everyone who is victorious. He who is victorious will be clothed in a white robe and I will not remove his name from the book of life. Instead, I will acknowledge him before my father and his angels. I will make the one who is victorious a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall never leave that temple and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, that will descend from heaven from my God and I will write on him my own new name. To the one who is victorious, I will give the privilege of sitting with me on my throne in the same way that I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Come on, that's got to be good. It's got to be worth an hallelujah, hasn't it? I mean, it's got to be worth an hallelujah. <laughs> Revelation 12, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now the time of salvation, power, of God's kingdom and Christ's authority has come because the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He, accused the, he who accused them before God day and night, but they overcame him through the Lamb's blood because of the word of their testimony and because they loved not their own lives even to the point of death. Revelation 21, 7. The victorious will inherit these things and I will be his God. And he shall be my son. Victorious mindset. Just like you have to cultivate a thankful heart, so you've got to cultivate a victorious mindset. And that start by saying, I will not allow any lie, any deception, any accusation, anything false to be sown into my mind by the enemy either directly or through anybody else. I will take the shield of faith against every negative thing. Nothing is going to be sown in my mind to undermine my faith in the truth. Yes. Hallelujah. Because, beloved, you see, if you don't have a victorious mindset, you won't have the victory in your circumstances. Yeah. And we started with double-mindedness. What is double-mindedness? Well, one part of you believes the truth, the other part is speaking that which opposes the truth. That's double-mindedness. Yeah. That's having a divided heart. It's no good. Because as we saw, that would just lead to confusion because there's instability. And if you go through a period like that, we'll get back on track as fast as possible. Listen, it isn't that something needs to happen to you to get you back on track. It isn't that you need prayer. It isn't that somebody needs to do something. It's you've got to do something. Yes. You've got to kick out the negative stuff. You've got to focus on the positive. Yes. It's your responsibility. Your mind is your responsibility. It's nobody else's responsibility. It's not the leader's responsibility. It's not your friend's responsibility. It's not your husband or wife's responsibility. It's your responsibility. Only you can determine what is going to go on in your mind. Hallelujah. So isn't it good? 
to have a victorious mindset and a thankful heart. Amen. What a combination. Amen. Come on, let's stand. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, now let's do some mind work. It's your responsibility. So let's begin. I mean, God is going to give us the victory in all kinds of ways, but let's begin where we need to begin. By taking that shield of faith. But you see, you can't take the shield of faith against what's already there. So we've got to uproot any negatives that are already there. So if you're aware of any negative thoughts, any of those negative mindsets that you think in a negative way about yourself or about others or whatever, that you need to repent of because those things have got to be uprooted. We've got to uproot those things first. So let's do a bit of gardening now. And don't top off the weeds, pull them out. If you just top them off, they still grow again. But no, we need to uproot those weeds by the blood of the Lamb. Now, you've got to do that, so you just start doing it right now. Just bring those things to the Lord. Don't try to excuse yourself and say, well, Lord, it's these circumstances, and if that hadn't happened, and this hadn't happened, and if I hadn't been there, and if this... That's all nonsense. You've got to get that negativity out of your mind. Nothing outside a man defiles a man. But only that which comes from within. So come on, let's uproot all these things. Get rid of them. Reject those things completely. They don't belong to someone who is in Christ, seated in heavenly places where there's nothing negative, called to rule and reign in Christ. Those things do not belong to you. They're alien. They might be negative attitudes towards yourself. A negative perception of yourself that is a denial of the truth of who you are in Christ. So you need to say, Lord, I'm going to stop thinking of myself in that way. I'm going to see myself now with the eyes of faith. I'm going to see myself as one who belongs to the truth, not to all this other nonsense. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. If you feel that there's some negative thing that has been oppressing you, that's when you say, Lord, you are my refuge. You are my protection. You are my defense. I place myself in your hands. I believe the truth. I take the shield of faith against all those things. And I thank you that you fight for me to bring me out into the place of freedom, into the spacious place where I will not feel hemmed in, beaten down, and oppressed in any way. And even if you're not oppressed, but you know the enemy comes against you with those negative thoughts, this is where you take the shield of faith now. But, you know, you've got to keep doing that all day long. Some of you are perhaps going to have to go through what I went through years ago and just keep doing that until it becomes sort of automatic for you to, oh, I reject that, I'm not listening to that. That's, that's, that's just nonsense, that's rubbish. It isn't that you have to get all spiritual about it. You just reject it. You don't have to say, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over that thought and I reject You don't have to do any of that stuff. You just say, I reject it. 
You can say in Jesus' name if you like. You can say, that's not the truth about me. I reject that immediately in Jesus' name. If you reject it, it can't take root. And you have the authority to reject it because it hasn't come from heaven. It's not established in heaven. Those lies, those accusations have not come from heaven. So you reject it. Hallelujah. Now, of course, <clears throat> you don't just reject the negative, but you fill your mind with the positive. The more you fill your mind with the word, the easier it is to detect what is not of the word and to reject immediately that which is not the truth. That's why you need to be a man or woman of the word, just filling yourself with the word. It's not... It's not, well, I know the word and I believe the word. No, you need to fill, you need to feed on the word. I feed on the word every day. You need to feed on the word every day. Fill your mind with the word every day. I write out scriptures, I read scriptures, I pray scriptures. I, I mean, just fill yourself with the truth. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Right now, He's given us authority, so we've got to exercise authority. So we're going to exercise authority now over those spirits, the lying spirits, deceiving spirits, accusing spirits that undermine or seek to undermine the truth in our lives. Those are the spirits that the devil deploys to try to prevent you from being the person of faith God wants you to be. Now they may operate directly against you. They may operate through others that become the mouthpiece of the enemy. And you see what sometimes you, you're just conscious, I don't know, things are, why are things so difficult? And somewhere, somebody is projecting towards you something that's negative. And it isn't that you need to blame people and all the rest, but you need to take authority over whatever it is that is being directed at you. Why? Because he that is in you is greater than any of those things that are directed at you. So how do we... How do we take authority? Well, you, you know that. These are the spirits. So, you have to speak to them, not in tongues. They don't understand tongues. He that speaks in tongues speaks to God, not to, not to demons. If you exercise authority, you speak in your own language. And here you can name, uh, use the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus and through the power of his blood, I come against every spirit that comes against me and therefore comes against the living God his Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ, his son. And I take authority over every one of you negative spirits and I command that you leave and have absolutely no further influence over my life whatsoever. I confront you with the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are defeated. And I command you to go to hell where you belong and no longer come against me in any way. And Lord, I proclaim your victory over those spirits. I, I proclaim your victory over all those negative things. I proclaim your victory over every oppressive power of the enemy. I proclaim your victory over every false spirit. I proclaim your victory over every deceiving spirit. I pro proclaim your victory over every lying accusation of the enemy. In the name of Jesus. Thank you that I stand before you clothed with salvation, robed in righteousness with the garment of praise. And I bless you and I praise you and I exalt you for the victory. And I thank you, Lord, 
that because I have stood against the enemy, you go ahead of me, you fight for me, you give me that victory, you bring me into the freedom that is your precious gift to me. It is for freedom. You have set me free, and you've called me to be free. And I proclaim that freedom in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, let's hear it for the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Pura la bazatari elera bakarazita ba. Baparazat. Chad, let's have some music. Come on, we're going to praise God. We're going to end with our song of victory. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.